If you're familiar with my content, you'll know that generally speaking, I am not a fan of the Five Nights at Freddy's series of books. Most of them range from meh to bad, with a few notable outliers here and there such as the short story Out of Stock and other short stories including The Mimic. But the one book series I've never sought to defend are the Silver Eyes trilogy. The Silver Eyes trilogy comprises three books written by Scott Cawthon and Kira Breed Risley. Risley? Risley? How do you pronounce that? These three novels, while not canon to the game series, which remains the main story, are still a series that many FNAF fans look at with excitement. Personally though, I've never been that big of a fan. Whether it's odd story plot lines or straight up tropey writing, the Silver Eyes trilogy was consistently my least favorite part of the FNAF canon. By the way, canon is Scott's word in this case, I'm not trying to insinuate that the books and games share a timeline, because at least in the Silver Eyes case they physically cannot. As it stands, the first book is good and has merit to existing within the FNAF franchise. The other two? Oh my god, kill it with fire and then put the fire out with a guillotine. But even still, the Silver Eyes isn't a masterpiece. Its characters are flat and bland for the most part, and it becomes predictable and formulaic the longer the book goes on. However, there is an element about the Silver Eyes that I can't help but love. It's villain. The Silver Eyes plays around a lot with the history of the FNAF series. It's probably the piece of this franchise most consistent in its fixation on the events of the past. It's through this book that we're introduced to Dave Miller, otherwise known as William Afton. This book right here, this version of this character, this is my favorite version of William Afton, and I mean that wholeheartedly. And in the very next book, he goes from my favorite to the actual most terrible version of the character that wasn't written by teenagers on Tumblr. And we will definitely touch on that. Although in many cases of fiction, our favorite characters are often made more likable based on their relationships with others, with William it's kind of the opposite. Every time something new was added to his character following the first book, it was usually for the worse. And not just in the fact that he's a villain, but in the fact that they detracted from him having any semblance of a consistent personality. So let's talk about William Afton in The Silver Eyes. But before we can touch on William in the books, let's very quickly reestablish what his character had been like before the first book's release. At this time in the series, the character then named Purple Guy had appeared sporadically throughout the series. He was technically first mentioned offhandedly in FNAF 1, with newspapers identifying that someone in a cartoon mascot costume was seen luring kids into a back room at Freddy's, leading to the missing children's incident. In FNAF 2, we actually get a face to put to the name. Kind of. This is where the purple and purple guy comes from, as we see him represented in various minigames with the purple sprite, or other purple sprites. In FNAF 3, we saw his ultimate fate, being killed by the ghosts of his past victims after they scare him into a Springlock Bonnie costume, which activates while he's wearing it. This results in the creation of Springtrap, who at the end of FNAF 3 is hinted to have survived, but otherwise, this is the end of his story. FNAF 4 didn't do much in terms of Purple Guy content, with him only existing as an easter egg, showing another employee how to put the Spring Bonnie costume on. This may have actually hinted at this character being management at Freddy's, or even the owner. And that was it in terms of his appearances in the games at that point. He was by all accounts a fairly straightforward, if mysterious, antagonist. But the next time anyone would see the purple guy, he wouldn't be purple. In fact, he'd be a fully fleshed out human character. So let's talk about it. Also, I won't be holding back, so if you want to skip over the story recap, go to the time that is appearing on screen now. William Afton worked alongside a man named Henry to open a restaurant called Fredbear's Family Diner using the two Springlock suits they had made as their way of entertaining children. However, this relationship Henry and William had was deeply troubled underneath the surface. For whatever reason, William had developed a hatred for his business partner. A very complex hatred, one born out of jealousy, while also admiration. For whatever reason or another, William became fixated on Henry, and decided to act on this strange hatred. At the time, Henry had two children, a daughter named Charlotte and a son named Sammy. Donning the yellow Bonnie costume that William had worn many times before, William kidnapped and killed Charlotte. This event prompted Fredbear's family diner to shut down, and led to Henry's wife divorcing him and taking custody of Sammy. But the show must go on. While William was a suspect in Charlotte's kidnapping, he wasn't charged with the crime, allowing him to open up a sequel spot to Fredbear's called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. This time though, William would be far more vicious, taking five victims this time instead of just one. One of these victims was a boy named Michael Brooks, who would go on to possess Golden Freddy. Michael was also friends with most of the main characters of the Silver Eyes, which primarily takes place 10 years after Michael's death, now attending a memorial for their lost friend, John, Carlton, Jessica, Lamar, Marla, and Charlotte decide to dig a little further. 
I should mention though that this Charlotte is actually a robot Henry made that thinks it's Charlotte when in reality, alright I'm not going to get into the whole thing right now, just know that Charlotte is the main protagonist of this book. This group of friends then decide to go to the abandoned mall that was being built on top of Freddy's but had been shut down. It's there that they meet Dave Miller. Dave is an odd guy with his lanky, gaunt body and pale skin and almost soulless eyes. Not the type you'd expect to be working as a security guard, especially for an abandoned place like this. But when the teens said that they were going to see Freddy's, well, Dave just had to come along and demonstrate how familiar he was with the place. Dave is of course Willie Mafton, hiding out and adopting a new identity. He even changed his appearance, dropping much of the weight he had during his killings, and after sneaking away, Dave came back, this time wearing the Spring Bonnie costume. He kidnapped Carlton and put him into a Springlock suit. From this point on, we learn a lot more about what happened to William. When he takes off the Springlock suit, we see his body riddled with scars and oddly symmetrical placements, as if his entire body had been branded. Maybe not branded, but cut in such systematic ways. William Afton had at one point in time been Springlocked, however he was able to survive and escape. It's unclear when this happened or why, although this event may have been part of the reason he hated Henry. While Afton goes off to kill Officer Dunn, a police officer who was looking for Carlton, Charlotte and the others manage to free their friend. Unfortunately for Dunn though, William was able to stab him through the heart with a knife, hiding his body among empty animatronic suits. When the teens encounter Afton again though, they manage to get the drop on him and knock him out with a metal pipe. After tying him up, he wakes up and delivers possibly my favorite Afton moment in FNAF history. I was initially just going to talk about this scene, but I felt like it would be better if I just actually read it off for you. So listen in for the only audiobook you can hear on the Demuted channel so far. Dave continued to stare, and it was only after a moment Charlie considered that he might actually be staring at something. She turned, following his line of sight, then suddenly she recoiled. On the table along the wall sat a rabbit's head. That's it. You want that? Charlie stood and approached the mask. You need this? She added in a whisper. She picked it up, carefully the light catching the edges of the spring locks that filled the mascot head. She picked it up and carried it almost ceremoniously to Dave, who dipped his head down in a barely noticeable fashion. Charlie placed it over his head, not being nearly as cautious as she had been with Carlton. When the mascot head was fully resting on his shoulders, the large face raised itself until it was almost completely upright. Dave's eyes opened steadily, glassy and without emotion like the robots on the stage outside. Lines of sweat began to trickle down from under the mask, a stain darkening the color of his uniform shirt. My dad trusted you, Charlie said. She was on her knees now, looking intently at the rabbit's face. What did you do to him? Her voice broke. I helped him create. The voice came from inside the mask, but it was not Dave's, not the pitiful, sour tone they had recognized. The voice of the rabbit was smooth and rich, almost musical. It was confident somehow reassuring, a voice that might convince you of almost anything. Dave cocked his head to the side and the mask shifted so that only one of his bulbous eyes could peer through the sockets. We both wanted to love, he said in one of those melodious tones. Your father loved, and now I have loved. You killed, Carlton said, who then burst out with something that sounded like laughter. He seemed more lucid now, as if anger was focusing his mind. He shook loose of Jessica's hands on his arms and knelt down on the floor. You're a sick bastard, Carlton sputtered, and you've created monsters. The kids you killed are still here. You've imprisoned them. They're home with me. Dave's voice was coarse, and the large mascot head slipped forward and tilted as he spoke. Their happiest day. How do we get out? Charlie placed one hand on the mascot head and pushed it back into position on Dave's shoulders. The fur felt wet and sticky, as though the costume itself were sweating. 
There isn't a way out anymore. All that's left is family. His round eye reappeared through one of the sockets, glimmering in the light. He locked eyes with Charlie for a moment, struggling to lean in closer. Oh, he gasped. You're something beautiful, aren't you? Charlie recoiled as if he had touched her. What's that supposed to mean? She took another step back, fighting a surge of revulsion. Well, then you're trapped too, and you're not going to be hurting anyone else. John said in response to the veiled threat. I don't have to. Dave answered. When it gets dark, they will awaken. The children's spirits will rise. They will kill you. I'll just walk out in the morning, stepping over your corpses one by one. He looked at each of them in turn, as if relishing in the bloody scene. They'll kill you too, Jessica said. No, I'm quite confident that I will survive. Really? John said suddenly. I'm pretty sure they're the spirits of the kids you killed. He all but spat. Why would they hurt us? It's you they're after. They don't remember, Dave said. They've forgotten. The dead do forget. All they know is that you're here, trying to take away their happiest day. You are intruders. He lowered his voice to a hush. You are grown-ups. They looked at one another. We're not- Jessica began. You're close enough, especially to a vengeful, confused, and frightened child. None of you will survive the night. And what makes you think they won't kill you? John said again, and Dave's eyes took on something shining, almost beautific. Because I am one of them. It's here that the climax of the book really begins. The teens try to escape, and Afton gets out of his binds. He manages to get the rest of the spring bonnie suit back on and tries to give chase to them. Eventually, he captures Charlotte and holds her in place while he threatens the rest of the teens not to move or he'd kill her. But Charlotte knew his weakness. She reached for his neck and pressed a button underneath, causing the suit to go off. For the second time, and the last time, William had been springlocked. While he started dying, screaming on the floor, Freddy and his gang dragged William far into the pizzeria, where he presumably died. Until the next book, anyway. Alright, so let's talk about William's personality. By the way, if you skipped to the end of that last segment, welcome back. William is best described with a single, two-word phrase. F***ed up. And I love it. William is never portrayed as a good guy, he's always portrayed as someone who seems to live in their own fantasy world, who either doesn't understand their own actions, or more likely, doesn't seem to care. His delusions are present, but never to the point where they overtake his entire personality. Except during that interrogation scene. Why this one? Well, if you ask me, it's probably because this was the most scared William had probably ever been in his life. He was bound and tied by people who knew who he was and what he had done, which is why he spouted off about what he actually thinks he's done. In other videos, I've said that Afton thinks of himself as Spring Bonnie to a point where he doesn't talk without the head. And although that was a little misleading, I do think to an extent it's still true, but it does go further than that. William doesn't like talking except when he's in disguise. As Dave or as Spring Bonnie, you can hardly get Afton to shut up, but when confronted with reality, that's when he clams up. That's probably the best part about Afton in this book specifically. It's how he goes about commanding and creating his own world. He wants a family, so how does he make it? By wearing a disguise and taking victims who couldn't fight back. But he needs to watch over the place, so what does he do? He dresses up as a security guard and changes his name. Afton, in all accounts, is a coward who desperately wants control, but he's afraid of being confronted with the truth behind his actions. Is this because he thinks what he's done is good? No, it's out of fear that someone will find out what he did. This especially is a part of him that gets phased out in the next couple books, but there was one other element I wanted to talk about here. Aside from Afton's fear, the other big thing defining him as a killer is his obsession over his victims. It's not clear why he wanted a family of dead kids, Maybe to give him some kind of ownership he craved and didn't have. So now that you know how William was built up in this book, let's talk about how he was torn down in the next two. I'm going to try to keep this as brief and non-spoilery as possible, but basically it comes down to Afton feeling way, 
way too comfortable after what happened in Silver Eyes. In Silver Eyes, at his core, Afton was a cowardly, frightened man who only wanted to hide his dark secrets greedily, not caring about his actions so much as the punishment for those actions. But Springtrap? Well, uh, he seems totally cool now. He's got these cool robots now, that's pretty dope. Oh, and also he reveals one of the biggest mic drop truths to Charlotte just... because? Seriously, in this moment of the book that I won't elaborate on, he just tells her the truth. He's not pressured to do so, he's displaying none of that fear he originally did. And okay, maybe it's because he's wearing the Spring Bonnie suit, and now he's Springtrap. So, should wearing this suit automatically make the character boring? Some of Afton's best scenes in the last book were when he wore the costume, because the costume was his weapon. It's what he used to put on his most sinister face. Should that costume being fused to his body now just completely remove all of that cowardice? Some might argue it should, but then we get to the fourth closet, just you wait. Also, this truth he tells Charlotte is monumentally huge. I would say much larger and far more relevant to her story than that of the missing kids. I mean, this Springtrap is chasing people and acting all high and mighty, when most fans would agree through playing FNAF 3 that he's not like that at all. He's a brooding stalker who seems to always know where you are, but is never sprinting at you like Foxy. Fourth Closet William is the worst though, by far. I got nothing to say about him other than he's... boring. So, canonically, he just kinda gave up on being Springtrap. That's it. He just got bored, I guess. Oh, and he also remembered his robot daughter. Now, there is actually one likable element about this William, and it's why he uses Baby so much in this book. Apparently, in removing the Springtrap suit, he could not remove all the animatronic parts, which is why he's wheelchair and crutch-bound throughout the book. These parts still cause him so much pain, he can barely move. But then this makes me wonder how the hell he was moving at all when he was wearing the Springtrap costume. If he needs a wheelchair now, how come he didn't need one then? Also, he just gives up the Spring Bonnie costume despite that costume being half of his character in the first book? Sure, I guess, fuck consistency and sentimentality. But the biggest downside, and the thing that makes this Afton the worst to me, is his lack of fear, period. He just doesn't care. Fear was what defined William in the first place, everything he did was out of his greed and self-preservation. Now though, none of that. He got rid of the Spring Bonnie costume, but it didn't change much. And the way he goes out, it's okay, I guess. Carlson gets infused with remnant juice and can see ghosts, and tells them that William is their killer. This convinces the fun times and a fused endo to drag William into a furnace, killing him. It's an alright ending to a character who had figuratively, and then literally, been murdered. But the thing we have to ask ourselves now is this. Will we ever see Silver Eyes William again? It's hard to say. If anything, the way Vanny and Glitchtrap behave and act does remind me of William's expressiveness he had in the Silver Eyes, but that's pretty much all we've seen come out of this specific incarnation of the character. I do think the movie has a chance of bringing this version of William back considering that we've already seen evidence of other Silver Eyes scenes making an appearance. For example, Abby hiding from Foxy in the arcade is a shot not only lifted from the graphic novel version of the Silver Eyes, but a very specific moment from that book that I don't imagine is going to be our only connection to it. It even has the same setup. I'll be blunt, I do not think Matthew Lillard's character is going to go by Steve Raglan the whole movie. I do think there will be a reveal that he's William Afton. In a way, that would make Steve Raglan the movie version of Dave Miller, an alternate identity William adopted so he could stay close to Freddy's while also remaining anonymous. However, that's the last piece of evidence we have for William returning like this in some way, shape, or form. I really like this version of the character and wish we saw more of him. More so, I wish we saw the same amount of care and thought put into who this guy was in later books or even the games. This is my favorite version of the character because he's the only one who actually feels like a unique character. Someone worth talking about who doesn't just fulfill an archetype or slap a name onto a monster. At the end of the day, William Afton in the games is not really a character so much as he is just an identity, an idea. But William in the books? That is straight up his own unique monster, and I love it. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe, and comment down below what you think of Silver Eyes William or the other book versions, and definitely, definitely be sure to check out my other content. Until next time, I'm Demuted. Peace.